Uh, Sarah Soderstrom couldn't be with us tonight, so I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, um, Monica Deuce. My name is Maren Spolum. I'm a staff member here in SNRE. Um, so Monica is an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology, lover of cupcakes. Um, the work of the Deuce Lab was recently featured in NPR, and one of the aspects that I appreciated hearing was um, about Monica's concerted effort to train young female scientists. Um, rumor has it that along with being brilliant, a few of them are also a bit nasty. So please welcome me in joining Dr. Monica Deuce. Hi everyone, it's really an honor to be here today and I really enjoy uh, all the talks. So, eating is a universal phenomenon. From ugly to scary animals to cute ones to zombies, all organisms have to eat in order to survive. And our feeding decisions about when, what, and how much to eat are really determined by a lot of different factors. Um, some of these um, decisions, like when to eat are determined by the interaction of both our genes and our environment. While others, like our food preference, our innate food preference for sugar, is really dependent largely on our genes and the way our brains are wired. And other things, like our connections to people, our memories, our cultures, play a really big role in <coughs> our eating decisions. So eating is this really complex phenomenon that encapsulates all the things, and in many ways, this is why it's important to study in an interdisciplinary way. But um, to a uh, reductionist uh, scientist like me, eating um, <laughs> is also simple. It's about basic biochemistry and nutrients being perceived and processed by a body. And the basic biochemistry of eating, it's really something that was carved out and shaped by millions of years of evolution. And in fact, it was really um, during animals' evolutionary histories that it was variation in nutrients level from scarcity to abundance that shape our eating patterns into this motivated behaviors such as our hunger and satiety states. And this behavioral states, our hunger and satiety states, are beautifully regulated. We eat when we are hungry and we stop eating when we're full. Or so, we did so for a majority, the majority of our time on Earth until recently where something happened. And so since the 1980, we've seen here a big increase in the number of calories we eat every day, and with that, the incidence of, the incidence of obesity and its associated chronic diseases. And so today, we have 1.6 billion people <coughs> worldwide that are overweight and obese. And this happened just in not just the last few decades, and it really begs the question of what changed in our environment, because our genes definitely didn't change. And one of the things that changed is that our food supply became inundated with a cheap source of sugar. And so if we go back of thinking about eating in terms of basic biochemistry, then we can, we be can ask the question whether a high sugar diet alters the fundamental biochemistry of the brain to reshape our feeding patterns. So to answer that question, we let them, fruit flies, eat cake <laughs> and not bread, like Marie Antoinette said, and then we ask what happens to their brain on sugar. So why flies? Flies uh, eat what we eat, they're in your kitchen, stealing your food, but also 75% of the human disease gene have a mirror in the flies. And flies have these incredibly complex behaviors and amazing genetic tools that people have used to map really complex traits like addiction and even sexual orientation. And so we want to use some of these proven ways to then try to draw a causal link between a high sugar diet and overeating. So we give flies either a high sugar diet or a normal healthy diet, and then we ask what happens to their feeding patterns. So when we put flies on a normal diet here in red or a high sugar diet in dark red for two weeks and then look uh, their number of licks they do in the respective diets. What we see is that early on, if you look at here, the high sugar diet flies in the dark red actually eat less. And this makes sense because that high sugar diet is six times more calorically dense. And this is a reflection of this beautifully regulated eating patterns. But as time goes by, you can see that the high sugar diet flies start eating a ton more. And this, so this whole uh, aspect of behavior becomes deregulated. And in fact, the flies on a high sugar diet become obese. But 
Um, food intake is not the only thing that's changed by a strict diet. They also lose the ability to keep track of nutrients. So uh, flies, and this is true for rodents and humans, when they're given a choice between a real sugar um, that is nutritious and a fake sugar that is not nutritious but delicious, as they become more fasted, prefer the nutritious sugar. And again, this is the reflection of those regulated behaviors. But flies on a high sugar diet for just a few days, when fasted, don't choose the real sugar, actually lose the ability to track nutrients. And so in my lab, we, uh, to get to the underlying biochemistry, what we, look, uh, what we do is to measure changes in metabolites and changes in gene expression, and then to link, to link this to changes in brain activity and the behavior. And so the question we really want to ask is that, what are the persistent biochemical changes caused by a high sugar diet, and how do they lead us to overeating? And hopefully, starting from biochemistry, from the biochemistry, we can just then build a more comprehensive picture by talking to people in this room. So um, I want to thank my lab, all the amazing people here. Um, and we do have one boy in the lab. And these are just awesome sources of funding. So thank you.